Yeah, All right. One in my backpack. Your first uh, total carnivore steak Cheers, shake. Cheers, man. All Bing. Right. It's really wow. smooth. That's a one sipper right there. You just down the whole thing. I love it. So I was listening to your podcast and um, you had the guy on who's talking about heart disease and stuff. And what are some of your thoughts on like how, how much of a mover could diet be? Um, let's, let's say that uh, somebody already has an issue. How big of a mover can diet uh, participate in helping somebody that maybe has um, some calcium or has artery blockage or something like that? Yeah, I think diet is probably 70 to 80 percent of it when it comes to um, causing atherosclerosis or contributing to the narrowing of the coronary arteries. Uh, and largely because, as you know, insulin resistance is a huge driver of the uh, atherosclerotic process. So essentially what happens is our coronary arteries, the arteries that, that feed oxygen to our heart, our heart is continuously moving. They're very, very small. And so they're susceptible to becoming calcified and narrowed. And it turns out that insulin and iron overload and uh, things like that can really exacerbate the narrowing of the arteries. And so uh, I, diet is huge, but also exercise, I think is under-recognized. And not just going to the gym, but something that you've been promoting and staying efforting these these 10 to 15 minute walks yeah. interspersed throughout the day it turns out that being inactive is really really uh, a huge driver of heart disease and all cause mortality and then <clears throat> maybe we could say like just simply by moving around you're going to be kind of you know shuttling some of those calories into like particular areas you're going to utilize it as energy rather than maybe it getting stored rather than maybe it like clogging up the system type thing sure that and then just the muscular contractions are really good for helping the tone of the blood vessels, the endothelium. So um, yeah, it turns out that even if you just stand, but you're not moving like someone, a cashier, yeah. it's, as, it's as bad as being sedentary. So the, the cut point in terms of steps we need is minimum 8,000 steps per day. For every 1,000 steps we take below, let's say you only get 7,000 steps per day, your risk of develop, developing heart disease or dying increases by 15% for every thousand steps off 8,000. So if you only walk 4,000 steps per day, you're almost at 100% increased risk of dying from all causes or having heart disease compared to walking 8,000 steps per day. So that to me, I think is really fascinating. And these are studies in 229,000 people. Mm -hmm. I have one of the papers here we can talk about later. Uh, just incredible data. So we all should be moving a lot more because when we're sedentary, we cause exercise resistance. So when people just go to the gym, like you and I might train later for an hour, but if we just sit all day, that one hour training session is not sufficient to unwind being sedentary all day. Mm. So we need to constantly move our muscles, be walking, get up, you know, go to the car, take the stairs, you know, at the office place, for example. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, if you go back in time, we probably used to be so active. Yeah. Hey. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I got a salmon scrambled here. Great, thank you. Side of bacon for you. And then here is the avocado toast at Amen. We'll be right back at the breakfast. Great, great. Wow. Wow. Looks amazing. Yeah. We Good job, get, Mark. I'm excited. We got to get some forks. Yeah. We got to dive in. So when it comes to carbs, how, how many carbs or how much carbs are you eating nowadays? Does it depend on training? Yeah, it really just depends. It depends on how I feel. Yeah. Um, sometimes I just want them, so I'll just eat them. I try not to, uh, I try not to be too like food averse, you know? I try not to be like, um, you know, develop some sort of weird relationship with the food. Yeah. So um, things like bread, uh, things like uh, uh, fruit, yeah. rice, potatoes, um, bread is pretty rare, but I will eat some bread here and there. Mm -hmm. um, I will eat pizza. I will eat ice cream. I'll eat all these things, but yeah. they need to like kind of fit into like the flow of what I'm doing. Um, I used to binge, so I used to be like a low carb guy. And I was like, don't eat any carbs. Carbs are bad. And then I would binge though. You know, I'd have like a cheat day. And then that cheat day turned into like a cheat weekend. <laughs> and I learned from that experience. When I was young, that actually worked really well. And, and really all that would happen is my muscles would get more full and I would look jacked. As I got older, um, the degree of my like binge would be like longer. Yeah. And what I was doing on the weekend was, was kind of got slowly like worse and worse. You know, I was just piling up as much food as I could because during the week it felt so restricted. And then uh, more recently over the last probably two, three years, I started to move into a diet that just doesn't feel restrictive at all. So that's why we could have all this amazing food that we have here today. 
and I'm not really worried about the calories. I'm not like, oh, I'm eating you know, 60 grams of carbs and there's probably like 60 grams of fat here. Like that's just gonna end up here or gonna end up blocking my heart. So I don't worry about it as much as I used to. Nice. Yeah, me too. I think it really depends on exercise, like the volume of exercise and training. But I, but I like that idea of, you know, if you're too restrictive all throughout the week, then it can sort of unwind itself on the weekend if you just have a blowout, right. you know. I also um, enjoy, I enjoy kava, I enjoy kratom, I enjoy coffee. So I feel like I have, I enjoy bone, bone broth. I feel like I have these like, um, and your, I'm sure your kitchen looks the same. I mean, I'm taking this and then, you know, mixing electrolytes in there and like doing all kinds of weird like chemistry in my, um, and, and even like tea, just straight up regular, you know, green tea, black tea. Yeah. Um, I feel like those things, um, occupy me enough to where uh, I might not be as ex as um, consumed in my brain by the food because I really like I really love to eat totally I <laughs> absolutely too. love it what about alcohol are you drinking alcohol nowadays or no I haven't I haven't had a drink um, my wife uh, really liked wine a lot yeah and she told me sometime towards the end of last year she's like I want to stop drinking I was like oh that's cool like a sober January dry January and she's like no forever Wow. And I was like, okay. It's like forever's a big statement, but I'm with you. You know, yeah. if that's what you want to do, uh, let's go for it. So I actually kind of told her like, why don't we just do the year yeah. and see how the year feels. I don't really care about alcohol, but mm -hmm. I know that for her, it, it uh, enhances some experiences. So I was like, let's just see if we can ditch it for a year and kind of go from there. Yeah. That's what I did too in 2023. So I'm like 450 days, no alcohol. Nice. Um, but I think for it's a lot easy of people, to it's easy to have that be a downhill. Oh yeah, you know. Well, I think what people don't realize is they have one or two glasses of wine, then they have some ice cream, some cookies. They're less inhibited, and they, their diet goes off the rails. You know, plus the alcohol gets converted, you know, into other toxic compounds, promotes fat gain, insulin right. resistance. Uh, it mimics fructose metabolism, which is problematic. So, so I think walking is huge too, and we'll get to chomping on this food in a minute. Yeah, <clears throat> but um. You know, walking, I think, is a good uh, base. It's a good start for a lot of people. You mentioned, you know, 7,000, 8,000 steps a day <clears throat> being a good uh, marker, a good, good place to start. Do you think people that are, um, do you think for some people they need to push that a little bit more? They, they obviously need to do more than just walking, right? Oh, 100%. I don't think walking is, like, going to help uh, support all the major muscles in the body. I, I think, but... I think it's, it's just a fundamental practice, period. Just like the base. You like don't have to even view it necessarily as exercise. It's just like part of the day. Right. Check like that box for walking, just like you would with a shower or brushing your teeth, right? Exactly. Yeah. And and then try to bake in some form of resistance training at least three to four days. I think three days on the minimum, up to five if you want to actually build some muscle. You know? And so major compound movements where we're moving two joints or more at the same time, squats, hip hinges, presses, pull-ups, all that. Um, and then if you're someone who's maybe more active, like if you're someone that likes to rock climb or you uh, get on your bike often, uh, you like to hike, maybe the resistance training could be pulled back a little bit. Totally. Right. Yeah, based on how much volume. Or something, right? Oh, yeah. So th that's just my recommendations. But the people that have physiques that, that are impressive, they're training four days a week, at right. least, I would say. Or doing these other sports that are pretty intense. I think that's probably the most unfortunate piece of the puzzle is that uh, guys like you and I, we don't have real jobs. <laughs> right, true. And so we just go out there and we, you know, we hone in and we have a lot of time, <clears throat> um, e even just the, the mental capacity, the bandwidth yeah. to, you know, put into the food. I would just say it's easier. It's easier for me. I'll say that I'll speak for myself than it is for someone that has a, you know, nine to five job, you know, maybe working for like FedEx or something like that. Like yeah. I just, I have to admit, I have it easier than them. This is true. But what I would say in that situation is they can have exercise snacks throughout the day, do some push-ups, do some military wall. They're already getting steps in. They're already getting their steps in. You know, I mean, the UPS driver that services my house, sometimes he'll drop off, two, he'll have 200 visits throughout the day. So 200 homes or businesses. So he's moving 25, 30,000 steps on those days. So in that, and he's, you know, continuously stressing the muscles by moving boxes. So in that case, you know, those individuals usually don't go to the gym and they look pretty good. 
you know, but if, if one is really sedentary, a desk job, a secretary, an office manager, that's where they need to be a little bit more intentional about hitting the gym, getting the steps in, structuring these exercise snacks every hour. You know, just go out to the car and spend five minutes. Right. It doesn't take too much. Uh, this food is pretty uh, like nutrient dense. You know, enticing. we got some uh, we got some cholesterol going on over here. I'm going to grab whatever one sure. you want to first. And uh, wow. what do you think? Um, what do you think in terms of like cholesterol and and uh, and some of those things? Because we hear a lot about you know cholesterol, you know, um, in high amounts from your diet could be a bad thing. What are some of your thoughts from that? Yeah, so that's actually a myth. Um, dietary cholesterol has no impact on serum cholesterol. So that's, I think, a myth that a lot of people need to unlearn. And that's been, that's been shown like time and time again, like not just one study, right? We have multiple studies. Numerous studies. In fact, if people are worried about their total cholesterol, which I don't think they should be, they shouldn't drink coffee. Coffee actually raises cholesterol. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of things that, that, that impact cholesterol that no one's even really concerned about. But, you know, what's interesting, Mark, is we would think if cholesterol was the de facto cause of heart disease mm -hmm. that life insurance companies will care about LDL cholesterol. It turns out they don't. Right. They care about the ratio of your total cholesterol to your HDL cholesterol. And the way that we can increase our HDL cholesterol is eating good fats like this, avocado, eggs, mm -hmm. and also exercise. So if people are concerned about their cholesterol, they really need to be more concerned about the ratio of their total cholesterol oh. to HDL. And I think even more importantly, their blood triglycerides. Because um, your blood triglycerides really tell the story about your metabolic health. And there's not enough emphasis, in my opinion, on triglyceride reduction. A lot of people have high triglycerides, and doctors don't really say much about it because there's not a, there's not a statin to lower triglycerides. The best way to lower triglycerides is exercise and fish oil. So there is medical foods that lower triglycerides, right. but you and I can drop our trigly triglycerides today by going to exercise, you know, walking. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a strong independent risk factor for future heart disease and all-cause mortality. So I think we should really shift the conversation away from just cholesterol or LDL cholesterol to more triglycerides, insulin, glucose, and focus on increasing HDL cholesterol, not just driving LDL to the ground. What's the reason for not blending too much fat and carbohydrates together? Yeah, like it that gets seems a little... To be, that seems to be like kind of no, like it's pretty well known now that in an energy surplus, uh, carbs and fats together seem like they could be uh, dangerous, especially for our heart. Yeah, well, it gets a little complex, but it has to do with the interaction with those, especially liquid fat, like fried foods, french fries, pizza, uh, donuts, things like that. The liquid fat paired with high carbohydrates can cause an interaction with our gut bacteria. And we start to increase these pathogenic bacterial fragments called endotoxin and that can drive inflammation. So if we think about the foods that are inherently problematic, like I mentioned, the baked goods, fried foods, chicken nuggets, um, and liquid soda, for example, or even if you look at a milkshake, because a milkshake, you have a lot of cream and fat, and then you also have the sugar, that is going to cause, um, uh, well, it, it causes impairments in our circulatory system known as endothelial dysfunction. People have heard about this in the case of erectile dysfunction. So erectile dysfunction, ED, is synonymous with endothelial dysfunction. So if you think about your, your arteries as a pipe, that pipe needs to be fluid like a, a new hose, mm. but it can become rigid and, and tough and inflexible, and that's problematic from a heart disease risk perspective, as well as dementia and all the that. blood flow is not getting to the area. Exactly, just reduce blood flow. So the liquid fat paired with high amounts of carbohydrates together is problematic. Mm. And then you think about the most problematic foods, milkshakes, yeah. donuts, uh, fried foods, liquid plus carbs together, usually more problematic. Now that's not to say that you can never have them. One way to mitigate that is to go for a walk after you would have, say, a milkshake. Um, and, one, and, and another way to mitigate it would be just to have a, uh, a decent understanding of how much uh, energy, calories you need per day. Yeah. Like I kind of hate referencing calories because it, it's a complicated topic. Right. And it's not like your calories don't get reset to zero every day. Um, but something magical is not gonna happen whether you have carbs and fats together or whether you have protein and fats together. Um, but it makes sense to be uh, ca cautious of carbs and fats because when you eat them, it makes it very easy to overeat. Totally. And so, do you, would you say that, I mean, I guess we can go off the wall as much as pot, you know, we can like, 
yeah, do something super crazy, but would you say that like we're pretty safe if the energy balance is kind of even? You know, someone is, uh, someone's supposed to eat around 2,000 calories a day. I know you're more of a fan of fitness and more of a fan of like healthier decisions. Right. Um, but do you think it really matters that much if somebody was to eat like Skittles and pizza and so forth? It's a good question. I think we should all individualize this based upon our blood work. Mm. And the easiest test that we've been talking about now is actually... So we're not guessing, so we actually know. Yeah, so we know. I mean, th these theoretical calculations based upon our energy output and our body weight um, are really more reflected objectively in our blood work. So mm. looking at fasted blood work to get a baseline, and we're talking about simple tests that people can order or request from their primary health care practitioner, fasting glucose, fasting insulin, fasting triglycerides, ApoB to ApoA1, which are a little bit more... It's a, a more objective way to look at your uh, lipid levels in terms of your cholesterol, um, looking at LDH. I mean, there's a few different things. I have a cheat sheet on my website, you know, and so forth. But Mark, the biomarker that people want to focus on is their fasted triglycerides and fasted, fasted glucose and insulin. And so if someone says, oh, yeah, I'm in energy balance, I'm having Skittles, I'm having Kit Kat bars and stuff, everything's fine, but their fasting triglycerides are 150, everything's not fine. Mm. They should be closer to 60 milligrams per deciliter. And then if you have like high blood pressure on top of that, now we're talking a completely different ball game, right? Totally. Now, you, now you're in the danger zone. Yeah, now that diet, those dietary choices are impacting our metabolic health. And I like to use the analogy of metabolic trauma. People are familiar with therapy and trauma and this. You know, we can re-traumatize ourselves by having Skittles and Kit Kats and all that from a metabolic perspective. So we need to be more mindful, especially if our blood, blood work reflects that we don't have good metabolic health. Right. And so these blanket statements um, by fitness professionals, I think they're not individualized because a lot of people can have poor metabolic health and they're told, oh, as long as you're in a calorie deficit or neutral right. calorie balance, you're okay but their blood work may not reflect that. Um, fasting, uh, glucose, you said, right? Glucose, insulin, triglycerides. And then Mark, the you also- there. Try how you're sleeping and do you drink alcohol? Do you smoke? Like if these things start to compound on top of each other, now we're talking about your risk factor exponentially multiplying, right? Totally. Yeah, blood pressure, I think, is another huge one that's underappreciated, but is a, a strong driver for all these problems. I know problems. Stan Efferding has been talking about that a lot, and he shows, like, blood pressure on yeah. Instagram here and there. Yeah, really key. I mean, they have these at-home cuffs people can use, which are great, but also the liver, Mark, because what happens is our liver starts to get filled with fat as we get more and more insulin resistant, and so these liver enzymes that we can test, and these are on routine blood work, by the way, they're called LFTs, liver function tests, there's three of them. Those start to increase over 30 and that's an indicator of poor metabolic health. Mm. So AST, ALT, GGT, three acronyms for the three different liver enzymes. People should be running these when they do their annual labs. And I think everyone should be doing labs, you know. So what about for some people that are like in their 30s or so, like in their 20s, like I think it's good to just maybe just try to get into it if you, if you got a little bit of money to do so. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about $150. Okay. And so it's, what's cool is if you're in your 20s or 30s, you can get a baseline to look at your trends over time to see where you're trending. You know, because it turns out that these biomarkers we've been talking about reflect our biologic age. Mm. In fact, have you seen this thing where people are saying Gen Zers are aging like milk? They're not aging as well as maybe you or I, right. millennials or whatever. Yeah, according to my watch, which I don't know how accurate that is, I'm like 40 years old. It's <laughs> awesome. And I'm 47. Yeah, it's a great reflection of your dietary choices, you know. Um, so a lot of younger people have just grown up on more processed food and they're not exercising. They're on screens all the time, so it's affecting their circadian rhythm and aging. So get a couple, sneak a couple bites in there. Yeah, we'll let's do resume. it. Mm. Yeah, this we're at a for the people watching at home. We're at Rosemary's Kitchen. This is a place in. Uh, the area I live in, Dixon, California, and this is just a, this happens to be run by a CrossFitter mm. slash pa paleo girl. And uh, I've known her since like right around the time she started the business. Mm. It's been pretty cool because she's expanding. She's made this, she's done a lot of renovations to this place, make it a lot nicer, but then she's also moving, mm. I think in a couple weeks to a bigger location. Cool. That's kind of cool. And then she also, uh, uh, she does meal prep. Mm. And so I think that's how she was able to survive COVID because most restaurants went down pretty hard during COVID. Oh, man. 
That would have been so hard. Yeah. That's really cool. Is he going to move in Dixon or David? Yeah, he's going to stay in the Dixon area. Cool. Yeah. No, this is really good. It's great when you have places that uh, kind of service your needs. This is like a paleo-based place. Yeah. A lot of the bread and stuff is like either sourdough or gluten-free. Um, she makes like pancakes and all kinds of different stuff. It's almond flour. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think all that stuff's an interesting topic as well because you could you could lie to yourself right you know and you can say that hey you know i'm eating this sandwich every day it's healthy it's like bro that's like 800 calories mm -hmm. you know you do need to be conscious a little bit of how much energy we're consuming right no i agree that's good i love that i'm gonna try this out this is amazing this is just like straight up salmon and eggs that's awesome so you're doing more of an early time restricted feeding. You eat more in the morning and then have a smaller dinner. So I've been working on that. I suck at it. I, yeah. um, I what I've been doing because I'm good at uh, fasting is I've been primarily like just fasting. So I'll just take a 24 hour or 30, 30, 24 hour to 36 hour fast almost weekly at the moment, mm. working on getting leaner as you saw some of the videos and pictures, mm -hmm. um, just dialing stuff in a little bit because Usually if I'm going to eat, like I might eat all this by myself. Well, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I just, if it's time to eat, I just, I really enjoy it a lot. Um, and so I have to kind of like, I got to make rules for myself. I'm like a yeah. gremlin. Like if I don't have, <laughs> I don't have rules, I'm going to be screwed. I'm going to make probably, I'm not going to make poor choices in terms of the food. Um, I'm a, a ninja enough like in the food mm. space to like know, you know, what to eat, what not to eat. But sometimes I'll just choose to overeat. Yeah. So um but to answer your question when i do fast a lot of times i'll have breakfast like i'm probably going to do this today i'll probably eat this and i probably won't eat anything wow for the rest of the day hey? because it's going to service me a lot i'm, I'm going to be able to sleep way better uh -huh. so you know maybe after the podcast if we go on a run or something like that mm -hmm. i mean maybe i would get like this little tiny percentage faster or better or something right uh, if i had you know a couple of teaspoons of honey or something before we went and ru ru uh, ru uh, ran but uh i don't really sweat it you know yeah, I, I just i like uh, adaptation too you know so people ask all the time like oh are you getting weaker or like what about getting pumps and stuff mm -hmm. i just think it's just an adaptation period it's gonna mm -hmm. take my body a little bit to get used to it and then there's still sugar in the body. There's still mm -hmm. carbohydrates in there. Otherwise, I'd be dead. But no, it's really interesting. I mean, this whole nibbling versus gorging debate's been going on for like the past 20 years. Yeah. And there was a study in women, young women versus elderly women. And the, the elderly women, the investigators wanted to see like protein uh, synthesis and, mm -hmm. and if having a gorge, like what we're doing, a one meal a day type thing, mm -hmm. where you're having a lot of energy, a lot of protein, if that was sufficient to increase muscle protein synthesis in comparison to younger women, mm -hmm. they were nibbling smaller meals throughout the day. And it turned out that these elderly women had actually higher amounts of muscle protein synthesis by having bolus amounts, like a big meal like this. Yeah. So maybe as you get older, it's probably a better thing. Yeah. Because those pathways- that makes sense from like an evolutionary standpoint, right? Like right. you uh, are trying to sequester more energy this is why I don't like calories because it gets to be very complicated, but yeah. you're probably sequestering or harnessing more energy from that one big meal because your body feels that, that it needs to. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're feeding it consistently, maybe the body doesn't feel that it needs to, yeah. you know, really harness all the energy that you consumed. Right. Well, I mean, if you think about animals in the wild, monogastric animals like us, you know, humans have just a single gastrointestinal tract. We don't have these chambers like uh, ruminant animals, wolves, you know, other carnivores, even bears, you know, they're not getting, they're not going to the, their refrigerator and having a little <laughs> snack, right? They might get a, a herd of elk or a couple deer, gorge on it, and then mm -hmm. it may, may go a few days before their next kill or next meal. So it seems that humans would probably be quite similar. So this idea that we have constant snacks every two or three hours doesn't mm -hmm. really align with, um, you know, our, our evolution or natural selection. It does seem to make some sense, though, that um, it might be a healthier option to eat and be able to, like, go on, like, a light jog, yeah. you know? Yeah. That's kind of my perspective on it. Like, 
I don't know about like uh, you know eating so much that your guts feel like they're gonna burst. You know. Right. Um, I do understand that there are some like benefits of that. Like your body might produce certain hormones and like it might have an anabolic effect for like a lifter or something like that. But I think for general purposes, general health purposes, I think your heart rate and everything's going to be a little bit different. Yeah. If you really, really gorge yourself, because I, you know, again, if you think like evolutionarily, you're probably only eating like one thing at a time, right? Probably didn't really have you know seven, eight different things the way that we do now with the different spices and all the different access we have now. And I would imagine you would just get like palate fatigue. Mm -hmm. You know, you're eating something and and now you want to kind of uh, probably move on to something else, but at the time you didn't have something else to move on to. Whereas now, you could eat your dinner. And you could polish off, you know, a side of French fries. You have your, your cheeseburger, your French fries. You uh, easily overate all that because, again, there's a lot of carbs and fats and oils and so on in all that stuff. And then you're able to have, this, you got plenty of room for dessert, even though you're stuffed. Yep. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the variability. The more options we have, the more we tend to overeat. Mm. So, like, when people go to a buffet and there's, like, you know, cake, different types of cakes, different cookies, we're more likely to overeat that just because there's so much variety. Right. So reducing the the variability in the flavor profiles and, and options actually helps us un stay lean. Like what we're eating now, we have eggs, we have salmon, right. we have avo, bacon, right? I think, uh, you know, years and years ago, probably when I was like maybe early 20s, I just decided like, not to really salt my foods hardly mm -hmm. and like to just eat natural foods, um, fruit, vegetables, meat, so on. And I just, I kind of thought to myself, I, I thought like this would be a good idea to sort of recalibrate my taste buds. Yeah. Cause I was saying, I was like, I would gorge myself with food on the weekends. And so I practiced that for a little while. And I actually, when I would eat spinach mm -hmm. or when I would eat almonds or when I would eat uh, walnuts or when mm -hmm. I eat steak, I could actually taste the flavor of the meat or taste the flavor of the thing I was eating. Whereas it's so distracted if you have a roasted almond that has, I'm not saying that roasted almonds are bad, sure. but if you have a roasted almond that has salt on it, it tastes way different than actually just eating the almond. Yeah. When you actually just taste the almond, you're like, wow, that has a lot of robust and different flavors. And you actually chew it and take your time rather than just like slaughtering your food uh, it's a much different experience, and I think that process right there, I think, helped me a ton yeah. uh, moving forward. Well, it's almost like a reset. And now yeah. if you were to have the black diamond almonds that have all these different right. I don't. Eat, I never eat them. They're too much. So like, I don't, wow, I don't how do people even eat this? No, I always want to find, like, raw, unsalted. Sometimes a little salt uh, goes a long way, but, yeah, usually I try to just get them, you know, as raw as I can get them. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. I mean, I... I'd be curious, I don't know if any studies have looked at this, like how long it takes to truly reset your palate. You know, it's probably three months, you know, mm -hmm. but. Well, I, I mean, I, how quickly could we mess up, you know, some of these tribes that are pretty pure, right? you know, if they hung out in the United States for a little while. I mean, you do see it with uh, exchange students, right? Mm -hmm. They gain weight quickly. Oh yeah. Um, and, and not only do they gain weight, but they, uh, they look very unhealthy. Like they, they get very like bloated, you know? Yeah. And I think it's probably just a huge shift culturally in the types of food that they're eating. No, it's so true. I mean, a lot of people that come here from, say, the Middle East, and I say here, the U.S. or Africa or Europe, most of their friends and family, they put on like the freshman 15 in the mm. first year. And this is like well known. Uh, there's in Seattle, a lot of the Uber drivers are from North Africa or East mm. Africa. And I talk about nutrition. What do you eat? You know, this and that. Like, do, can you find foods you would normally eat at home, say lamb or raw milk here. And they're like, mm, yeah, I have an Ethiopian market or a, a Kenyan market, they'll, they might say. And I'll often ask them like, well, what happens to your family? Oh, they put on 15, 20 pounds because they like to binge on the American food. So it's really pretty sad to see. A lot of people could really use like a little reset yeah. on the palate. I think, you know, you hear people talking a lot. Thank you. You hear people talking a lot about single ingredient foods. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you know, how far you need to push it back. I don't know how strict you need to be, um, but it'd be a good idea to like try to limit it, but also uh, be creative because like, I think that people think that when you eat healthy, um, 
that healthy means there's no flavor. Right. Healthy means there's no taste. Um, so I think if you get creative and you utilize various ingredients, like we got smoked salmon, which is giving the eggs like a lot of salt flavor, right? I happen to love salmon, so I really enjoy that. There's some vegetables thrown on there and there's some of this uh, sauce. I think ideas like that, I think are really smart. If somebody is, uh, you know, if somebody has a chicken breast, I would be like, dude, I would never just eat like a chicken boring. breast randomly, right? Yeah. Um, let's maybe, you know, flatten the chicken breast, throw it in the oven so it gets some sort of life to it. Right. Um, and then maybe eat it with uh, like, like some potatoes or something or a vegetable. If you have it with a vegetable, it's going to go down way easier. You know, you have it with some, uh, you know, whatever, the, whatever your favorite vegetable is, it's going to make it way easier to eat. Well, I think you bring up a good point. And so people equate healthy eating with like being low fat because there's right. this conflation with fat foods and body fat, right. which has never really been shown to be correlative outside of the fact that fattier foods tend to have more high, higher calories per quantity, but it doesn't mean they're inherently fattening. So you take a boneless, skinless chicken breast or rice cakes or uh, asparagus or tilapia. These are what people would use in the bodybuilding space or fitness space right. to lose body fat. Very boring because we need salt, sugar, and fat. These are the things that make foods palatable. Mm. So you take away the sugar, you need more fat. And so that's why, you know, say carnivore is so popular because you're having tastier foods that are just low in carbohydrates and, and very simple ingredients. It's hard to overeat a ribeye mm -hmm. steak, for example, or ground beef. So I think that's one of the reasons why keto and carnivore have become so successful and popular um, in terms of how they shift the needle in body composition because they're inherently satiated. Mm -hmm. and, contra and it's easy to maintain that. It gets boring. Boneless, skinless chicken and broccoli, I mean, you do that for six weeks, you're gonna binge on Rice Krispie treats and mm -hmm. pancakes and whatever else after that. Where do you kind of sit on all this? Like, what's your, what's your food recommendation? What's your diet recommendation? Yeah, mostly, like, I would say modified carnivore, essentially. I mean, yeah, we're having bread, and I'll have right. white rice, and I'll have fruit. Um, but my main dietary staples would be whole eggs, ground beef. Um, I like to use a slow cooker for various cuts of, of beef, and I, and I like to use the bone in cooking. Um, so I buy a cow. Slow cooker is money. Oh, it's amazing. It's so easy. When people say, oh, I don't have time to cook. Really good with pork, too. Pork. I So I... I used to have pigs. I'm not a huge fan of pork for different mm -hmm. reasons, but um, I, I mean, I, I appreciate the taste and like mm -hmm. good bacon, but I'm just more of like a grass-fed beef mm -hmm. kind of guy myself. And then I'll have olives, I'll have- Well, pigs are usually raised inside, right? Yeah. And they um, have more omega-6s, right? Right. Well, pigs will eat anything. Right. It's hard to trick lamb and cattle and ruminants, but mm -hmm. pigs would eat Skittles, pigs will eat you. <laughs> I mean, if, if I were to follow my pig men, they would definitely, over time, probably mm -hmm. get into me. Um, so anyway, I, I like ruminants because of the fact that their stomach is breaking down, you know, the vegetable matter, converting it into to protein, um, and the ratios are a little bit different. And then all the different accessory nutrients, creatine, carnitine, zinc, uh, B12, things like that, you're going to get in red meat that you're not going to get in chicken. Mm. Um, That's what right. do you, you, uh, vegetables? Mm. Honestly, if I don't grow them myself, not really. Paul, I have, Paul Saladino got, got to you. Well, <laughs> it's, I, so here's the thing, Mark. In 2016. Watch out, I, there's a plant right there. I know, man. It might kill you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not into the whole idea that plants are out to kill you and, and all this sort of thing. I, I think there is benefits to, to plants, but I think commercially prepared vegetables do have things that we may not want, like herbicides and pesticides, right. you know, because of how they're grown. So if I go to a farmer's market and get some mustard greens, you know, I'm growing kale. We're going to make kale chips this weekend, right? So it's not like I'm totally anti-vegetable, right. but I just, I'm a little bit um, skeptical of... You have some yeah. in your diet somewhere, but you don't care about them that much. Exactly. And I found that when I eat high amounts of vegetable matter, my digestion goes to mm. shit, you know, so... And in terms of, uh, uh, what about like cheats or anything? You, you have cheats here and there, you eat yeah. a little bit of whatever here like and there. Like local ice cream or something mm. periodically, you know, a couple times it's a still month. Still trying to be a healthier option. Yeah, where it's more like whole cream. There's a little bit of sugar, right? Um, but honestly, for like a, a treat or a, a you know a, um, a cheat, we'll do like whole yogurt with blueberries and a little whey protein and a mm -hmm. little honey. Like yeah. that's really yeah, tasty. it tastes amazing. 
Tastes amazing. You're still getting that kind of fatty, sugary combo without all the refined sugar. What about for uh, like your daughter or like if you're celebrating like a birthday with her or like how's that working? We'll go to a restaurant like this and order a cake, you know, mm -hmm. from, made with almond flour and, and mm -hmm. things like that. But um, yeah, we just try to avoid like the hyper palatable processed snacky food, right. you know, Chips Ahoy or Oreos or Pringles. Sometimes uh, like we have, you know, events or parties or something like that and people come over the house and they bring, you know, various stuff and sometimes we'll have like leftover, basically junk food. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, we should maybe just give this to so-and-so. And I'm like, no, we just need to, unfortunately, we need to just throw it away. Yeah. Because who's it good for? It's good no for one. nobody. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's not, terrible. Not good for kids. Not good for for anyone. Um, yeah. In your house, is there like any like kind of like more like normal snacks? Um, we use the Simple Mills. They have like cheese it like mm -hmm. things. So sometimes we'll, but that's, it's periodically marked because... I like you don't have a lot of willpower when it comes to food. So if it's there, it's gone. Right, right, right. So it's like, it's better just to not have it, you know, to be right. honest. Now we, I had family over this weekend. So we got some of those simple mills, almond flour, cheese it type things, mm -hmm. made some guacamole. I do similar stuff. I have like legendary stuff or yeah. bus stuff or wh whatever I can get my hands on. That's just, and maybe someone could say, oh, well that's, you know, processed or whatever, but it's like, you're trying to uh, not eliminate completely, but you're trying to mitigate, yeah. you know, how much junk you have. Right. Totally. And then we'll have a lot of fruit, you know, yeah. um, so that's pretty much it. But, but you don't feel deprived at all because you have, you're eating uh, cheese, you're eating cream, you're eating butter, you're eating whole eggs, you're having uh, meat that has, uh, that's nutrient dense, both in macronutrients, micronutrients, right? Totally. And then I just like how you feel, like how your brain feels, your sleep, right. your libido, your ability to go to the gym and recover. That to me is more important than the short-term gratification from eating something that tastes amazing. Mm. It's sort of like alcohol, you know, you, you just enjoy it while you're eating it and then you have to suffer for six, eight hours afterwards. What's some of the information going around about like VO2 max, zone two cardio? Because mm -hmm. um, we did talk a little bit about, about walking. You mentioned how many times people should lift. Yeah. Um, and for, you know, heart and longevity, how important is kind of VO2 max and maybe trying to find some sort of exercise as either expressing the VO2 max or tapping into maybe some zone two cardio? I think that's all amazing. I do my VO2 max test every year and I've actually been increasing it a little bit, like five points a year. Oh, wow, um, that's a lot. That that's is a great. fair amount, you know, it's a painful test. Like you're suffering yeah. for <laughs> five, seven minutes. On a treadmill or something, right? Well, I, we did the stair stepper, but okay. you could do anything, yeah. Um, but it's really cool. So I was able to increase it as I get older by doing a lot of hiking in the summer, running, uh, walking and then explosive movements throughout the week on the concept two or the mm. skier. I or think the explosive movements are underrated. Totally. Those kind of creatine, you know, style workouts where you're doing like explosive med ball stuff because I think that uh, whatever way someone can kind of mimic a sprint, yeah, I think is really a really uh, smart move. Oh, yeah. then you're tapping into like the nervous system, and I think from a cognitive perspective, you're also tapping into the brain a lot too. Big time. And I, there is a lot of plasticity from the from the brain based aspect of it because a lot of like these new movements are not so much muscular stress but neurologic stress. So I think that's really good as you get older to really push push the envelope. And unfortunately, most people don't do it because they don't train with power. They don't use watts as an objective biomarker when they're training. Yeah. They just think calories or whatever. Right. But I like to use watts, especially on the concept too, or the ski erg, hmm. to really object objectively measure how much power I'm putting out. You know? Right. So yeah, I, I, you know, and to go zone, back. Oh, sorry. Uh, zone two, um, it, it, uh, what is zone two cardio? Maybe mm. define it for us a little bit. We're just in layman speak. You and I could have a conversation like this, you know, when we're exercising. And so you're still. And I could be on an elliptical, like I could be on any machine, right? Or, or I could be out on a jog or something. Right, a very aerobic. Right. And so that's why it's easier to talk when you're doing zone two training because you're not dipping into this anaerobic threshold part right. where your lungs are burning and you're kind of short of breath. Right. And so the zone two is helping with capillary density, mitochondrial density, and just helping to create the base so that when you ramp up the intensity, you have more fuel and ability to deliver energy to the muscle and extract waste products from those muscles being utilized at a high pace. Now zone two, I think people hear zone two, it's healthy. I'm gonna do zone two all the time. That's not what we want. And I think some people also so associate zone two with walking, which for most individuals, walking mm -hmm. won't be zone two. 
like if you're half, if you're even hill. just halfway fit, yeah, you're gonna have to wear a weighted vest or something if you're trying to get into zone two. Right, but it's usually like uh, 180 minus your age ish, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, is the number that we're looking for heart rate wise. Right, right. Yeah, so I think it's important. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of really good data right now on the benefits of high VO2 max and longevity. There's oh. just a few different okay. studies. There's more data for whatever reason on grip strength. And I think that is really, really important. Muscular strength, uh, grip strength, mm. um, we know is unequivocally associated with reduced odds of dying from all causes uh, and living independently as we get older. Because the problem is as people get older, they lose their mobility, their in, the ability to live independently. You're relegated to a nursing home or adult family home and quality of life just goes down. Yeah. Right, and, and you can kind of uh, speculate that that person's probably not super active because they're not using their hands maybe as much as they did when they were younger. So they're lo losing strength there. Well, most of these people, Mark, came and go to the bathroom by themselves. Mm. Like the most exercise they're gonna do is getting off the bed and going to the commode and back to the bed in yeah. a day. Because they're so weak and winded. That's brutal. A lot of these people, you know, if you talk to people in healthcare, they have congestive heart failure, diabetes, dementia. Mm. Like this is like the, the triad that is so common. And we can prevent all that by the foods that we eat and the exercises that we do or, or don't yeah. do. And then it's my understanding that zone two uh, like helps expand the heart or expand the left ventricle or something like that. Well, it just improves. I only have half the facts usually. No, no, that's, yeah, that's part of it. Um, but also just reducing the vascular resistance and decreasing blood pressure. So if you think about pressure in a system, if you only have, you know, uh, let's say you're gonna pour a gallon of water into a small little area, there's gonna be more pressure in the system if you don't have all, all the different vessels and capillaries to disperse that. So, so you're gonna, zone two, you're kind of stretching it gradually in a kind of a, a nice fashion, right? Exactly, so that's part of it. And just improving the resilience of your vascular system. Because where people run into challenges is changes in lack of resilience. Getting up in the morning, most heart attacks occur in the winter in the morning. That's where most people are gonna die from heart disease. Shoveling snow on a Monday. Exactly, <laughs> right? You got crappy sleep, yeah. high blood pressure. You're going from zero to 100. You're sleeping, everything's calm. You're getting up and having to move and your uh, vessels are really tight and, and like an inflexible pipe, not a flexible hose. Mm. And so that would cause the vessels to become inflamed and occluded and you get a, a in, infarct or a heart attack. Right. So when we're doing this zone training, we're just improving the pliability or plasticity of our vascular system so that it's more resilient. You have your own supplement line. And yeah. uh, what are some of the goals of that? Why did you create that? You created it maybe what, three, four years ago? Yeah, you know, really to help people sleep and perform better uh, during exercise and just in daily life. So we focus on hormone balance with DHEA and different, um, oh, cool. you know, uh, things like that. We are one of the only companies that pair creatine with electrolytes. So that's unique mm -hmm. um, because it turns out that creatine helps with hydration. Electrolytes help increase creatine's absorption. So we do the electrolyte sticks, but yeah, mostly just a, a really clean, clean line. I've been selling dietary supplements since 2006, mm -hmm. mostly in the doctor space and wanted to bring out some novel ingredients to just help people in daily living. And you've probably seen over the years uh, changes in, in your blood work yeah. via, cause like I know for myself, I've had the same thing happen where I was like, I don't really care. I don't really want to take all these supplements, you know, uh, there's magnesium and all this different stuff, which is kind of more like, I guess it's vitamins, minerals. Right. Um, but I did agree to, to, I did make an agreement with myself. I said, if this helps improve my blood work, I'm going to continue to take it. Yeah. And that's what happened. It's like these certain vitamins, minerals that I was taking was actually helping. So I'm like, shit, now I gotta, now I gotta take six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different things. Right. But like you said, having objective biomarkers to look at, you know, sleep quality, blood work, power in the gym. I, I think that's really important because we're all individual, you know, your genetics are different than mine. You grew up on the East coast, or I grew up on the West coast. Right? So it, we don't, don't all need to be taking the same thing. So yeah, using blood work to drive uh, evidence-based decision-making, I think it's really important. Mm. Well, thanks man. We'll just yeah, uh, finish awesome. off the rest of this food. Strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.